first, I may have to read some stuff off for you uh, because some of them get a little washed out on this. But uh, I'm going to ask you uh, if your favorite, if, if you have your fav a favorite color, if it's up there, pick that. If your favorite color is not up there, then choose one that you like. Okay. Um, and if you can't read the words that are there by the favorite color, I will read them off for you. Uh, so your favorite color was? Purple. Okay, uh, so write that down, purple. And I'm gonna read off the five words. Uh, this is kind of based on color theory. The, the color that you choose will uh, also uh, kind of reveal your personality. And they have five words on there. And what I'll, I want you to do is, as I read off the words, uh, make note of which ones you think uh, apply to you. Okay. Okay. So purple, uh, sensitive, creative, idealistic, free-spirited, unique. And just write down how many words you think uh, fit you. Uh, I'm sorry, your name is? Christine. Christine, your favorite word there? Our favorite color? Yellow. Yellow? Okay. Uh, so you have cheerful, creative, Critical, independent, and I'm losing one there at the bottom there. Let me see if I can see it. Articulate. Cheerful, creative, critical, independent, and articulate. And write down, you know, how many words you think really uh, will apply to you. And, and Tony, you blue. Do the same blue. Uh, peaceful, conventional, harmonious, conservative, and what's the last one here? Yeah, find the last one there. Get the table out of the way. Let me see if I can catch it. Uh, oh, let me just look on the slide itself. Uh, compassionate is the last word there. I'm write down how many uh, you think apply to you. And we'll get back to this later. So you can do, you can put your pencils down now. Because the first thing I'm actually going to talk about is visual perception. Because it's one of the easiest ways I can talk, tell you how your brain works. Uh, we really, we talk about the five senses, but we really live in a visual world. Uh, all the time our brain is getting this constant stream of visual information every moment of the day, and we're trying to make sense out of that information. And we have all sorts of experiments now to kind of show you what's happening with your visual perception. Uh, in fact, for our visual perception, it takes about one third of our brain to translate the world that's coming in from our eyes. So I'm going to show you some pictures of celebrities. You may recognize some of them. You may not recognize them. Uh, this projector squeezes things a little bit, so they're a little more narrower than they, uh, they normally are. But uh, they should all should be looking relatively normal for you. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, them again, but in a little different way. I'm going to show you two at a time. And in the center, there's going to be a little plus sign, a little cross. I want you to focus on the plus sign. Focus on the cross that's in the center. Just keep aware of the celebrities in your, your, your peripheral vision. But don't look directly at the celebrities. Keep focused on the cross itself. Now, as you keep aware of the celebrities in your peripheral vision, something weird should be really happening with those faces, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're starting to really look distorted and stuff. Okay, now look at the faces. You can see I'm not doing anything to the faces at all. Look at the cross again. Wow. And it goes back to being all exaggerated, right? Like caricatures almost. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because even though we generally have really good high definition vision, our peripheral vision isn't really that good. It's quite poor. And what happens is your brain is interpreting the, those people in your peripheral vision. It's noting the contrast between the light and the dark areas, and it's exaggerating the areas that it thinks are important to you. Because of our central vision, it's actually really about the size of our thumbnail. That's our high definition vision. And then, of course, we have our peripheral vision, which is quite blurry and so so I guess really the, the point I'm going to make about this is the next time you see something out of the corner of your eye it's probably not a ghost it's probably your brain just deciding what might be important and it's exaggerating that 
in your peripheral vision. So our brain really evolved uh, to look at nature. We've only lived in cities for relatively a short time in human existence. And because of that, we see things as a whole. We don't see them in their parts until we decide to see them as your parts. When you look at a tree, you see a tree. When you look at a tree, you don't go, oh, that's the trunk, that's the branches, that's the leaves, oh, that must be a tree, right? right. See how we can kind of gather things together to see things as a whole? And that uh, makes sense because if we had to figure that out every time we left our house, we'd never get anywhere. So our brain actually has many different shortcuts in order to organize the world to make sense of it faster. We call this Gestalt theory. There's all different kinds. Uh, I, I go in, in great depth with this uh, in my Magnus One program, but I, I will end up talking about a couple of these things later on. Uh, but there's other rules our brain uses uh, to make sense of the world and to understand the world. And one of the things is context. Now in this context, you have four balls that are sitting on a, a wooden board. Each one is a little bit further away from you, right? Is that how you perceive it, right? I'm gonna change the context and then I'll change the meaning of the picture. Now, it seems like the balls aren't going further away from you, they're in a row. And each one is floating a little bit higher above the board. Just by changing the shadows, I can change how we perceive that. Another optical illusion for you. This is called a Ponzo illusion. Now this upper yellow goldish bar there seems larger than the lower one, except they're exactly the same size. Now your brain sees, the, even though this is a two-dimensional picture, your brain kind of sees things always as three dimensions, or perceives it as three dimensions. So it sees those parallel lines going off into the distance, looking like they're going off into a distance, like railroad tracks. And since the upper horizontal line is, appears the same size, but it appears further away, your brain actually makes it seem bigger than it really is. Let me show you another version of this. This is the exact same illusion. Those three cars are exactly the same size. And you're going, no, there's no possible way. This arrow that I have on the back uh, will not change shape or, or size, but you will see it covers the back of the smallest car. And when I move it over, it covers the back of the next car. It covers the back of the next car the same way. You can get up there and measure them with your hands or fingers, and it will, they will all be the same size, but it's our brain making us believe that each one is a little bit larger than the next. So our brains also use experience, prior experience. You know, you touch a hot stove, sooner, hopefully sooner than later, you learn not to touch the hot stove again. So I'm going to give you a little experience test here. Which direction is the school bus going? Those who think it's going to the left, raise your hand. One person. And the rest of you, I assume, are going to the right. Are you going to go left or right? Right. Right? Right. We'll right. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, your name is? I think you're Marcy. Yeah, you're Marcy. Marcy? I'm going to forget immediately, but. Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. And what it was? Christine. Christine. And Bob. Yes. No, <laughs> Robert. <laughs> That's the, um, the interesting thing is, it, with this test, uh, children 10 and under get it right 90% of the time. Those who said left are correct. Why? I don't know if you if you ride the bus all the time, you could get this like kids do. Oh, for school. bus driver! They would get it right. Exactly. They're, where's the door? The door is on the other side. Mm -hmm. If the door is on the other side, what side does it have to be? It has to be on that side. You're looking at the driver's side there. Mm -hmm. But because we don't have as much experience riding buses, 
we have trouble doing this as adults. This is absolutely one of my favorite optical illusions, the checkerboard illusion. So square A and square B are exactly the same color. I always look to see if people are looking at me like I'm crazy. Uh, so why does B look so much lighter? Well, our brain is doing a couple things here, experience and context. We know that a checkerboard should be alternating colors, right? So our brain knows that B should be a lighter color. Our brain also sees that shadow that's cast by the cylinder. And unconsciously it's going, oh, that shadow must be making that square too dark. So I'm going to lighten it up. So it matches my expectation. I'm going to show you a video of this. And you're going to see your brain adjusting for the shadow in real time. I promise this is not a special effect. So what illusions like this show us is that our brain isn't showing us the world that this exists, it's showing, showing us a world that thinks is useful to us. When it's in the shadow, our brain subtracts the shadow out, makes it light. When it comes out of the shadow, it stops adjusting, and it becomes dark. What it really is, the actual color of that square. I want to try this. I have one illusion that's done with color. You guys see red strawberries there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so sometimes people are colorblind, or like when I'm doing this on Zoom and their computer at home, who knows what colors they have, that kind of thing, and stuff. Um, this photo of the strawberries actually works exactly the same way as the checkerboard. The strawberries are pure red, but they're not. They're actually gray with a little bit of green. So why do we see them as red? Well, it's something called color constancy. And it's our way, brain's way of correcting the world when we filter under different light. So our brain says, I'm seeing these strawberries under bluish light. So I'm going to subtract that blue bias from that. And we subtract the blue bias from the green and gray pixels, you get red. And so the original picture was, you know, red. And then we put a blue filter over it and we can check all the different pixels to make sure they're not come up and coming up as red, and they don't. But our brain still sees that as red in there. So all of this starts to seem like we have this kind of hidden brain that's connected to us, that's making all these decisions for us. Uh, uh, the thing is, and these things we can't override. These are wired into us by this point in our lives. We learn these things as babies, we start they're doing it right away. And all of these are patterns that our brain has recognized. We are pattern-seeking animals. We see patterns everywhere. And we start, again, start learning them from birth. The most important is the human face, which we see everywhere. Right now, your brain is giving you a little shot of dopamine because you're making this facial connection also, which is the happy hormone there. In fact, this starts very early. So, I have a friend that teaches cognitive science in, in Wisconsin, and he, uh, Carthage College, and he, uh, when, it, when I started doing these programs, he reviewed them for me. And one of the things he, he told me to stop saying was hardwired. Hardwired in your brain. Because that implies that you're born with it, and that's not the case. Most of these things are learned, the minute you, you, you get into that, uh, are born, you start learning these kinds of patterns. And as soon as your visual processing starts working, you start learning these kinds of patterns. They become encoded in you as your brain is creating all these uh, uh, neurons for you. And so, uh, I hate to do that, but even babies will recognize. So this test was done with babies. They showed them figure one and figure two. Babies stared at figure one much longer than they did at figure two. So it shows how early that kind of facial recognition is starting to happen. So another uh, deeply encoded <coughs> pattern is language and words. Right? Uh, and I'm going to show you how, how unconsciously you read. You don't have to really work at reading. Your brain just does it for you with this uh, little video here. Wow. 
Wow. So you can see how you just instantly know the words. Yeah. You don't have to work at it. Now obviously if it's a word that you've never encountered before or a foreign word, that's a, again a different thing. But the words that are in your brain now, that you've learned since you were born, that's, in, that's unconscious reading for you. And now we're going to show you, I'm going to show you a couple other things through this. You may have seen a paragraph like this yeah. passed around on Facebook and emails and that sort of thing. And basically the idea is uh, you can read it. It takes some of it takes a little bit more challenge than others, but the idea behind it is that the first and letter, the first and last letters are the same. You can jumble up the letters in the middle and you can still read it. Your brain makes sense of it. It's not quite true though. So I hate to debunk this meme, but I'm going to show you some other sentences that use the same mixing up, but you're going to see some of them become very difficult to read there. Especially that last one. Right? So, just so it doesn't drive you crazy, these are the actual sentences. Now what they actually sort of believe is that our brains uh, see words as shapes. It's almost visual, because we really think in pictures and stuff. Uh, so it sees those words as shapes. So even uh, they've tried tests where they blur them out and you can still read. Now the interesting thing is, is that the top one is much easier to read than the bottom one, because the bottom one is all capital letters, so it's less <laughs> of a shape. Where the top one with the uppercase and lowercase you get a much better defined shape and it's much easier to read there. So, I have fragments of letters here. Does anyone have an idea what it might say? Jumping to conclusions. And that's the problem. So one of the things about our brains and Gestalt theory is we hate uh, incompleteness. Our brain really hates incompleteness, so it fills in. And in this case, it, there's a few things because <laughs> it looks at nothing, but you jump to a conclusion because yeah. your brain automatically applies a rule to it, even though the rule's not necessarily correct, but it, it's the best guess at that time, right? But you're filling in information all the time like that. In fact, we're, we're going to talk about patterns and filtering here. So I just want you to, when you find the six, raise your hand. The six. The six. We got it. Quick. There we go. Good, good, good. Six. Okay. I'll start with you can. Uh, when you find the W, raise your hand. Oh, been back. She got it right away. Oh. And we'll get you there. So one more word game here. Just read this paragraph to yourself. So how many people were caught by it? Who was caught by it? Did you miss the two does? Didn't there? Didn't? Yeah. No, Didn't I got it. You missed those? Yeah. So, uh, Again, our brain learned the rules of words and sentences and how they come together so long ago that it has a tendency to throw out information. That's uh, the W and the six, same thing. Once it decides on a pattern, it's easy to find out the thing that breaks the pattern and throw it out, so you just have what's needed there. And believe it or not, this kind of pattern uh, filtering has a lot to do with superstitions. Our brain decides on a pattern and throws out what it doesn't fit, even though there's important information there. In fact, the need to find patterns, meaningful patterns can be good or bad, harmless or harmful. Um, for example, a cause and correlation. Uh, this, I, I love this cartoon. Uh, this is a great, one guy is thinking correlation and the other guy just is thinking causation. Everybody who went to the moon has eaten chicken. Good grief, chicken makes you go to the moon. If that were only the case, right? We'd, I think we'd all love to go to the moon. But he's making a connection where there isn't one there. 
So I'm going to talk about uh, a causation, a pattern uh, uh, thing that our ancient ancestors found out about. They recognized this pattern uh, when, they, when they chewed willow bark, it reduced pain. Medicines made from willow bark and, and similar plants appear in clay tablets and papyrus from ancient Egypt. Around 400 BC, it was used in tea to reduce fever. Willow bark extract became uh, recognized for specific effects on fever, pain, and inflammation about the middle of the 18th century. By the 19th century, pharmacists are widely prescribing a variety of chemicals related to salicylic acid, which is the active component in willow bark. Uh, you might know it better as aspirin. Right? It's the original natural medicine. But you know, our ancient ancestors tried a lot of different plants. Some of them probably killed them, killed people off, and they decided that's a plant we shouldn't eat. Some of them cured illness, and that's a plant we should eat. But pattern seeking can get somewhat overactive. Uh, because we can find causes where there are none, and these, like I said, are called correlations. And I found that there's a wonderful website that has, uh, at least, I think, fun ones here. So the per capita cheese consumption correlates with the number of people who died be by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. That there's no causation there, it just happens to correlate. This is my favorite. People who drowned after falling out of a fishing boat correlates with a marriage rate right in Kentucky. So the less people get married in Kentucky, the less people drown by falling out of a fishing boat. Perhaps that needs more study, because that's a solid like causation, doesn't it? <laughs> so we're going to try another game here. This is where you need your pencil and paper. Uh, there's right behind you, the little container there, there's pencil and paper. Take one. Uh, we're going to give you a chance to win some money. It, it, it's imaginary money because we are going to play an imaginary stock market. I am going to show you a group of stocks. The only thing you will know about them is their name. I want you to choose three to invest in. And you're only gonna get about 15 seconds to do this, okay? So look over it real quick, and then write down the three that, that you want to invest in. Ready? Go. Okay, you have them? Now we're going to see uh, whether your stocks went up or down. So, if you had uh, all three stocks go down, raise your hand. Yeah. Okay, if you had two or more stocks go down, raise your hand. One or more stocks go down, raise your hand. Okay, so we're split. This is always a, a difficult test because we, when we do these kind of psychological tests, it's about averages of people. So if I have 100 people, we're going to see more people that, but we had at least one person uh, with all three stocks go down. Uh, let's take a look at these stocks again. Do, uh, doing these tests, again, with hundreds and thousands of people, we found that three of these stocks are the most commonly selected stocks. And those three are these. Why? They're words. You can pronounce them. They are familiar. And we uh, trust the familiar, which is why I made those three stocks crash. Because often, trusting the familiar can get you in trouble. So our brain is actually wired to trust the familiar. Uh, when we encounter something familiar, it act activates the parietal and the occipital lobe. It gives you, gives you a shot of oxytocin, which is where dopamine is the happiness hormone, oxytocin is the love chemical. We literally love the familiar. Now, if our brain encounters something strange or unusual, it activates the fear center of our brain. Danger. It releases cortisol, 
which is the stress hormone. So trusting the familiar sort of gave us our species a biological advantage. You think of, you know, friend or foe, right? Is that person part of our tribe or not? That's how we end up suspicious of someone or not. Good plant, bad plant. This is where we find food, don't find food, that sort of thing. These are all patterns and all familiar things to do. But we've, but we've sort of outgrown the, the worry for many of those things. And so uh, we like to stay in our comfort zone. But staying in our comfort zone also uh, means, is the reason we pay 30% more for brand name products over the generic product, which is just the same. Uh, staying in our comfort zone is often why people stay in bad jobs because it's, they're afraid to try and go out and look to see, well, I don't know if that would be any better, I might as well just stay here. Right? Or even bad relationships. People you see often, you probably have known people that have stayed in bad relationships for years and years sometimes before they ever get out, if they ever get out of those relationships. It's all because of that. But outside our comfort zone is where you can find meaning in life. Even. And you can do little things in your life. Uh, I have a group of friends that I go to lunch with every Wednesday. And for a while, the, the, guy, the one guy who kind of runs the whole thing, he was picking the same restaurant all the time. And I'm like, I live in Batavia, Illinois. We have lots of restaurants. I want to eat at all of them. And so I would force them to try and go to new and different restaurants to, to see, instead of, be honest, the, the restaurant we were going at had mediocre food anyhow. That's a way you can get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Uh, I have a, a Woodman's grocery store by me. And I love Woodman's because they have such a huge selection of stuff. And so I always make a point to buy something I've never tried before. And actually, I, I tell you what I did buy recently, although it was from Costco. I love uh, Italian sausage, peppers, and onions. I usually make them myself, but Costco had a pan and it was like with a red sauce and stuff. It was horrible. I, I had a couple pieces, it was like greasy and stuff, I threw it out. Here's the thing, I know never to buy that again. And it only cost me, you know, 10 bucks to learn that lesson. And I'm okay with losing 10 bucks because I could find something spectacular. Because I found other things that, at Costco, Woodman's that I've tried that I go, oh, I'm gonna eat this all the time now, I love this. That's what's about getting out of your comfort zone. But let's get back to our pattern recognition skills. What do you see here? Don't be afraid to say, use your wildest imagination. What do you think this is a blurred out picture of? Go ahead and just yell it out. Kangaroo. Kangaroo? Bone? Uh, I'm sorry, like phone? A bone? A bone? A bone? Take a guess. You, 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 you should think like a, this is, so the, I've seen an interesting test done where adults have trouble coming up with multiple ideas, multiple like explanations for this sort of thing or for a picture. And children come up with dozens and dozens of them. So one of the, if, if you ever, if somebody's looking for an idea, if you're looking for an idea for anything, try thinking like a child. So now think about a child. What would a child think they saw? See up there? A dinosaur. A I'm bunny. Sorry. A dog. What? A bunny. Bunny. What was somebody else said something? Dinosaur. Dinosaur. Okay, I'm going to clear it up a little bit more. Fish. A fish. Fish. You said you said fish. Yeah. You're close. Shark. There we go. Yeah. We'll give you another one. Each one of these is going to get progressively harder. Um, so, but that's okay. All I want you to do is use your imagination to make guesses. So go ahead, guess. Giraffe. A giraffe. Lobster. Lobster. <laughs> Sometimes I get flower. Turtle. Turtle. Clear it up a little bit. Rose. Oh, basketball game. Oh. Whoa. This was the hardest. I really kind of pixelated this one. It, it'll take a little bit to get to it, but take a guess. Oh, jeez. A sponge. Sponge. A waffle. A waffle. A waffle, waffle yeah. yeah. Um, yarn. Actually, there's nothing there. <laughs> it's just random noise. Wow. 
Whatever you, you're seeing exists only in your mind. But your brain's ability to see random patterns and random noise is actually key to how superstition is performed. Because not only does your brain detect patterns, it creates them. So superstitions arise when your pattern recognition skills system gets a little too enthusiastic and makes connections between random things and events, finding meaning in that. One of the best examples of creating patterns out of randomness is the night sky. Because we not only need to find patterns, we need to find meaning in those patterns. We create patterns where none exist in the night sky, and then we create an entire belief system based on these imaginary patterns in the sky. Your brain is making meaning out of everything really around you. Uh, you've seen a flip book, right? You know what a flip book is? Just a bunch of still pictures. But our brains, in our brains, it becomes something so much more, right? Even one at a time, we create the motion, we create the thing. This marquee. It looks like the light is going around the sun. But you know it's not. Our brains create the movement and the story. It's not actual reality. Again, this is useful to us though. This is part of uh, the incompleteness. Our brain hates incompleteness. This is part of Gestalt theory. When you look at this image, most people perceive it as a white square overlapping four circles. That's not what this is. This is four circles that have a quarter missing from them. But because our brain hates incompleteness, you're probably drawing in the lines where lines don't exist for the square. Maybe even shadow to help it seem a little more three-dimensional coming off. Here's another image. Focus on the center of it. You should see four black circles connected with a blue circle. And if you see it, you're just like everyone else. But just because you see something doesn't mean it's really there. That blue circle is only existing in your mind. It's really four circles with a little segment of blue in them. But because our brain hates incompleteness, it completes the blue circle. Wow. And your brain's ability to see that blue circle that doesn't exist is the same thing that makes you superstitious. For having so much knowledge and technology at our fingertips, humans can be awfully superstitious. And they come in all shapes and sizes. And in fact, I'm betting that some of you may have superstitions. Lucky coins, socks, shirts, other objects. You have may, may have rituals to create good luck or get rid of bad luck. Now, the logical part of your brain should be saying, this doesn't really affect any outcomes. But there's another part of your brain that's saying, why take a chance, right? Which is why some of you throw salt over your shoulder, knock on wood, wear a lucky shirt when the, you know, the bears are playing, or the cubs, or anyone else. Play the same lucky lottery numbers every week. Well, I want to tell you, if they were lucky lottery numbers, they would have won by now. <laughs> so the question is why? Obviously, we can't control the universe, but we take comfort in feeling that we can. No one likes to feel out of control, right? So we come up with rituals, beliefs, habits we think can affect things and how they turn out, whether good or bad. And if you've ever read the short story, The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, you know about a ritual based on imaginary beliefs that turns out very bad. And if you haven't read The Lottery from Shirley Jackson, I'm sure Tony will help you uh, get to it and read it. Uh, it's one of the great short stories of all time, I think. So. Uh, so to get to the core of why your brain is superstitious, we're gonna look at that blue circle again. There's no blue in the center or in between, but the blue arcs make your brain believe that there's a blue circle. And pictures like these show that our brains have a tendency to add information, almost like that jumping to conclusions thing, where you added the information on the bottom half there that wasn't there. 
your brain is wired to do this. In fact, being able to recognize this pattern has been key to our survival, whether the pattern is real or imaginary. Finding meaning in the picture in this case, but, but that's really another definition of superstition. Superstition is any strongly held belief your brain creates that has no basis in reality. You see, your brain rather have a false positive that's benign than be wrong. So imagine you're walking through a jungle and you see a snake, but it's actually a stick. Well, that's embarrassing, right? But you're still alive. Now you're walking through the jungle and you see a stick. No worries, you step on it, but it's actually a snake, which bites you. Now you're dead. But this is how our brain has been programmed to thinking better safe than sorry when it comes to our survival. Superstitions seem like the safer option. And it all comes back to, to needing control in a uh, chaotic world. So this is kind of a, a deep part of personality psychology that I'm going to talk about here. There's something called locus of control. A person with a strong internal locus of control feels that they're mainly responsible for their outcomes in life. While a person with an external locus of control gives more credit to things like fate and luck and chance. Uh, there's no, this is not binary, you're not one or the other, there's, it's a spectrum, generally. Some people fall more further on one spectrum than the other, but really, uh, think about yourself. How much do you feel you're in control in the outcomes of your life? How many times are you always going, oh, that person's lucky, that person's lucky, I'm never lucky, that sort of thing. That means you have a more external focus of control, because you feel like something outside of you is controlling you. The other thing is that you can change that. Now that you're aware of it, especially if you're aware of it, you can see how you're doing that. So other things that kind of cause you for some of this uh, superstitious thinking, uh, stress. So people that are stressed and dealing with uncertainty, feelings of no control, are more likely to engage in illusionary thinking, conspiracies, or superstitions. And how many of our, I, I know Tony, a uh, baseball fan, right? But uh, how many, any of you others, baseball fans? Baseball, sports, at any, at all? Okay. Two of you, yes, two of you, no, that's okay. We're gonna use baseball as the example, though. So baseball players have all sorts of rituals and superstitions when they're batting. But when, when they're playing the field, they overwhelmingly don't. Why? Fielding is 90% or more successful. Where, but the very best batters in baseball have 70% failure rates. There's a lot of stress with batting. And that's why they have all those kind of superstitious rituals that they do often. Some more than others. Uh, no, no more Garcia Parra used to do a lot of touching and changing his gloves and everything else is crazy. Sammy Sosa I'm sorry? Sammy Sosa too. Sammy Sosa. Yeah. Oh, see, you did watch baseball. Yeah, I watched it. I had a big sport So we're going to go back to that color test that we did earlier. I'm going to ask you uh, about the descriptions because you wrote down how many words uh, apply to you or not. Uh, I, you weren't here for that, uh, but the other three of you. If it, you thought that description was Accurate, you can raise your hand. And all. So, guess what? You fell victim to what's called the Barnum effect. I'm not going to go through this deeply. I, on the handout that I'm going to give you, has this in detail. But what is it? It's a tendency to find personal meaning in generic terms that could apply to almost anyone. Basically, our brain is matching what it already wants to hear or what it already wants to believe about itself. And the belief in some of these uh, superstitions might seem crazy, but uh, think about your own life. Have you ever thought of someone and they called a moment later? Yeah? Does that mean you have psychic powers? Or is your brain making a connection that it wants to make? In fact, I hear people say this all the time. It's 
to one in a million chance. It, it couldn't be a coincidence. It has to be fate or luck or or psychic ability or whatever because it's a one in a million thing. Let's look at one in a million. So I grew up in Chicago. There are three million people in Chicago. So a one in a million chance to be happening three times a day. Your spouse is one in a million. 39 of them in California. 7,500 of them in the world. See, weird stuff happens all the time just by chance. The math says it must be so. In fact, what would be really weird if crazy coincidences weren't happening, were not happening all the time. So it turns out that a one in a million coincidence is no coincidence. Take the phone call problem. You remember the time your friend called and matched your thought, but you've kind of forgotten all the times you thought of your friend and they didn't call. Because we remember the hits, we forget the misses. Uh, so our brain uh, filters what it thinks is relevant to the task at hand and keeps it. The rest of it labels as garbage, discards it even if there's important information there. And this misunderstanding of math, generic statements, remembering the hits, is the basis for all so-called fortune telling. From astrology to tarot cards, it's all just a bunch of generic stuff. And uh, if you look deeply enough into it about cold reading and stuff, people can say things that seem like they're very specific and not about you. Sometimes they give you contradictory terms and your brain, of course, just picks out the one that it likes the most or wants the most. And they often hook you the way a casino does. How many of you have uh, gone to a casino? So just you two again. You, you guys do all sorts of stuff. You guys don't do anything. You guys got to get out. Um, uh, you play the slots? Yeah? Yeah. When you lose playing the slots, what happens? Nothing. Crickets. When you win, all hell breaks loose, right? Flashing lights and coins falling and all this noise, sirens and stuff. It causes you to remember the hit and then you overestimate how much you won or the likelihood of winning again. In fact, some of these same factors uh, are why people believe in conspiracy theories, right? Conspiracy theories are having a renaissance these days. It seems like every day we hear some celebrity that thinks the earth is flat or believes the moon landing is fake or thinks that like Illuminati or lizard people are secretly controlling the world. <laughs> and again, it comes to uh, we just don't like uncertainty. So we fill in with an illusion of knowledge. So a test was done. They asked people to draw bicycles from memory. And it turned out that people are really bad at drawing bicycles from memory. <laughs> they actually tried to make some of the bikes and none of them would actually work in the real world. Only very few of them would. But we all believe we know exactly what a bike look like, looks like, right? If we were to imagine a bicycle in our heads. Let's talk about something closer to home. The zippers. We use them all every day, right? Do you know exactly how they work? You don't. You don't know that how they're designed is so that those teeth can come together and lock at an angle. It's not just some weird engineering in there to get those things to come together. They're just not together. But we all have the illusion that we know how zippers work because we account them all the time. So researchers think that we use conspiracy theories uh, to make sense of complex or upsetting events that don't seem to have enough or a good enough explanation. Something is too hard to process, you might look for other explanations. Others, sometimes it's just you want to have knowledge that other people don't, the illusion of knowledge. You want to be part of something. You know, for this, if the stakes are the, the beloved president's death, it makes more sense to your brain that there be some giant elaborate explanation, like a cover-up, than something simple like a lone gunman. But again, math can come into this. People who think you know, we never landed a man on the moon. It took about 400,000 people to get that man to the moon. 
from all over the world, engineers and scientists and clerical people and everything else like that. How are all these people keeping that secret? Thank you. If there's more than two people in a conspiracy, almost surely that conspiracy is going to get out. It's hard to keep that secret. Okay. And it doesn't quite add up, though. The other thing is that, you know, the idea of alien invasions, UFOs, flat earth, chemtrails, Illuminati, lizardmen. How can these conspiracy theorists keep believing on these improbable ideas without coming to terms with the literal mountains of evidence? Well, one of the things is we don't like to be wrong. In fact, it's literally painful for us to be wrong. Because when we're wrong, it activates the pain center in our brain. So we do everything to avoid that pain, including twisting us in, ourselves into knots to keep believing the wrong thing. And it goes back to some of our innate biases. Something called belief perseverance. It's a tendency to cling to our pre-existing beliefs to prove to the contrary. Nine out of 10 people disagree with my idea, which sends a very clear message. Nine out of 10 people are wrong. That's belief perseverance right there. And it's very similar to confirmation bias, but it has a slight difference. So confirmation bias, um, you have a pre-existing belief, and you don't bother to seek out anything that contradicts your pre-existing belief. Where belief perseverance is, you have this pre-existing belief and you still hold on to it and actively reject information that contradicts your ideas. Both of which are bad. And it's why people trust what a psychic tells them. They already know what they want to hear. They're looking for a so-called professional to reinforce their beliefs. Again, it's about controlling the world that you're in. The same goes for people who blindly follow uh, politicians, cult leaders, pundits, con men, I'm redundant there. <laughs> There's also a little something else that's going on in your brain. So you will believe an event is more likely to be true or more likely to occur if you can conjure up examples or memories of it that are especially vivid, awesome, or scary. You could easily think of a scary clown, right? because you can conjure up that idea, and that means that scary clowns are everywhere. Politicians and many media sources, especially the fringe, less mainstream media sources, frame their stories with these very vivid, very scary terms, right? And this gets us to believe that it's more likely to occur. And I, I again, living in the Chicago area, Chicago shootings. Every day on the news, we're seeing shootings going on, right? Mm -hmm. And so we think they're shooting people everywhere on every street corner in Chicago. But the truth is, 70% of all of the shootings happen in two districts, in two districts alone. And they're not the downtown district. They're not the theater district. They're not those kinds of districts. But because we keep seeing that in the news, it makes us and it's vivid and it's scary, it makes us believe that it's more likely to occur. occur. And, it's and it's always the, the big scare headline. So again, it seems like we have a brain controlling us with all of these things, but we mostly do good. But now that we, hopefully that you know, we know these things, we can say, okay, uh, maybe I have to step back and see if I'm staying too much in my comfort zone. Or is this feeding my bias? instead of maybe I should see if there's stuff that will break that bias, maybe that bias is wrong, that sort of thing. Uh, last but not least, the thing that I think is even the most important thing in here is I'm going to talk about brain health, because if you can't keep your brain healthy, what good is knowing how to do all these things anyhow, right? Uh, so your library is going to have all sorts of resources for this. There are a few things I'm going to keep stressing over and over again. Uh, this quote, uh, is 90% of what I'm going to talk about. The day you stop learning is the day you begin decaying. Hopefully you have learned something already in this program, which means I've made your brain stronger. You're welcome. <laughs> but, you know, there's people that try to sell you apps and stuff that are going to make your brain, brain stronger and remember more and all this stuff. Most of that's BS. Here are the things that are going to make your brain better. 
Sleep. You need to get enough sleep. We think of sleep as shutdown mode, but for your brain it's maintenance mode. That's when your brain decides what it's going to put into long-term storage and what it's going to throw out as garbage. In fact, the artifact of this process are dreams. And it's only because we look for patterns, we fill in the incompleteness, and we got to find meaning in that pattern, why we think dreams mean anything when they don't, they're just an artifact of that process. Uh, the other thing that happens is we believe uh, it flushes out some of the plaque that causes Alzheimer's when you're sleeping. So you really have to get enough sleep. Exercise. Walk. Lift weights. Your chair bound chair aerobics. What we found is the best, best exercise for your brain is dancing. So listening to music is just good for your mental health as it is. If you're dancing with a partner, you're reading their unconscious signals. If you try to move to the beat and the rhythm of the music, a complex pattern of footsteps on the floor, you're working spatially so you don't bump into other people. All sorts of stuff for your brain to do while you're dancing. Uh, one of the things I'm going to stress over and over again is the importance here is about new, novel, and different experiences. Now, exercise alone, just getting your blood pumping and stuff is very important. But you should also make it a new, novel, different experience. Uh, so if you walk, don't walk the same route all the time. Because you're not getting any new, novel, different experiences. I did this program and some friends of mine listened to it. And during the pandemic, they, they used to just walk the one trail all the time by our houses. They decided to walk all the different forest preserves in our area. And they did it in a mindful way because then they wrote about it on Facebook what the trail was like, the things that they saw, all that stuff. So they got to now be very present in the moment and we're taking in so much information, all this new, novel, different information. Got to make your brain stronger in that case. Learn a new skill. So I belong to my local library's writers group and one of my best friends in there was an eight-year-old minister who lived in a senior facility. And he told me one day that he was gonna, he was gonna take up wood carving. Eight years old, never wood carved in his life but they have a wood carving club in a senior facility. This is a great new skill for him because he, you, know, you draw on the figure, you do the cut, all that stuff. A lot of stuff for your brain to do. Now here's a couple things. So that's a new, novel, different experience for him. The other thing that makes it even stronger, he was doing small motor skills with his hands that he had never done before. That's gonna make your brain even stronger. That's gonna make strong connections in uh, those neurons in your brain. So, if you can mix, you know, doing crossword puzzles are good, reading is good, but if you can mix an activity with a physical movement, a brain activity with a physical movement, that's going to help you out. I will say that, if, you know, if you're a knitter, and you've been knitting for 150 years, and you do it unconsciously, you need to find something else then. Keep knitting, that's okay, but try to find something else that's going to challenge you, do different movements, do whatever, that sort of thing. Learn a musical instrument. Learning how to read music is like learning a new language. Learning how to hold the instrument, where to put your fingers, how, to, how hard to press, how to get the note out, how to get those notes together for a song, how to get that song with the rhythm and stuff. Lots of stuff for your brain to do when you're learning a musical instrument. Now here's a, a couple of those caveats here. If you already know a musical instrument or are proficient at it, to get that new novel, different experience, you either have to try a different musical instrument or you have to challenge yourself with harder and harder musical pieces. What's great about this and like the new skill, you don't have to be good at it. That's not the point of this process. The point is giving your brain new novel, different experiences. I will say though, that if you're not gonna be good at the musical instrument, don't take up the drums. <laughs> your neighbors will thank me. Learn a new language. Now your library will have an app uh, to teach you a new language. We found that people who are bilingual and use both languages often stave off the effects of dementia longer. So if you know two languages but you're only using one, that's no good. You have to use it, otherwise you lose it. Both the language and you know, your brain. But that's one of the best ways you can do it. And you can find people in the community and stuff to talk to online different things like that to learn a new language or talk a little bit in that language. Last is diet. 
We found that a heart healthy diet is a brain healthy diet. So if you've ever had a heart attack or hypertension, your, your doctor probably gave you the DASH diet. Uh, the Mediterranean diet, very similar. They combined the best of both into what's called the MIND diet. Uh, again, uh, common sense stuff, right? More whole grains, more vegetables and fruits, uh, some nuts, uh, beans, poultry, fish, good. Uh, bad are pastries and sweets, so red meat, that sort of stuff, cheeses and fast food. And of course, there's that uh, glass of red wine every day, which I'll be having when I get home because I want my brain to be stronger. Uh, I have, uh, like I said, all of that is on the handout that I'm going to give you.